Greetings, I'm Christian from Cinema Nova and welcome to the Intermission Interviews. We invite guests from across the filmmaking and cinema industries to reflect on their past, review the present and reconnoitre our shared future during what has come to be known as the Intermission. My guest today was a colleague of mine at Village Cinemas before becoming the Programming Manager for Wallace Cinemas in South Australia. She was recently appointed Programming Manager for the Gold Coast Film Festival and is a recipient of the Natalie Miller Fellowship. Welcome to the Intermission Interviews, Sasha Close. So Sasha, the last 12 months have been nothing short of eventful. For you, what have been the standouts? Um, so we're going to look back at uh, 2019 so fondly. Um, a couple of things that stand out for me, um, last year for me was definitely the year of the, the doco. Mm -hmm. And there was three great docos that, um, particularly Australian ones that, that I really loved. And one I think we spoke about before it hit cinemas, which was Mystify, the Michael Hutchins story. Yep. Um, I also attended the MIF opening night and um, look, I, the Australian day dream didn't resonate with wider audiences, mm. but is certainly an important film um, culturally to this country that, that I was definitely a highlight for me. And the third doco that, that I, I really liked I guess as a parent, um, was 2040 um, and that, you know, what that doco kind of outlined quite simply that, that um, we can all do to help, to help, you know, kind of turn the tide and um, combat cl climate change um, mm. was really important. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, all three films really, really struck a chord with me too. I mean, um, The Australian Dream was easily the best opening night film for MIF. Uh, well, in living memory, uh, and uh, and in the case of 2040, I mean, uh, it was obviously at the start of last year, but um, hopefully it's a movie that a lot of people look back on now and start saying, okay, well, you know, here's an opportunity for us all to to rethink how we live our lives, and that movie provided a lot of really great yep. kind of avenues to do that. Yep, absolutely. Um, another event that, that I attended, which... Um, it was kind of a, a, in the film industry was a women in film lunch at the Gold Coast Film Festival last year before I actually joined them. Um, and for me, leadership um, in the film industry, particularly, you know, for women, um, is really important. And the keynote speaker at that was Greer Simpkin, who um, is a, a producer. Um, Mystery Road Season 2 starts um, very shortly on the ABC. And just hearing her thoughts, how she navigated um, the film industry and built her career and was so open and generous with, um, with the audience um, about what she'd achieved um, really struck a chord with me because I don't think um, there's enough of that sharing in, in the industry. I know, you know, you and I talk and we have colleagues that, that talk in smaller groups, but... Mm in terms of actually platforms for people that have crafted really amazing careers to share that with, with women um, and you know, everyone in the, in the industry, how they've, they've crafted their careers, the, the detours that they might have taken and, and what they're most proud of is, um, is, is really important for our industry to, um, to inspire people to um, stay, stay with the career that they've chosen. So. Mm. That was a really great event. Yeah, it's interesting to think, I mean, just in the last sort of 12 months, you're right, I mean, the the discussion around representations really kind of have been taken to the next level, not just uh, for women, but also um, uh, Indigenous voices and people of colour, uh, as well as yep. people who are in the LGBTI spectrum. And um, for me personally, uh, it's interesting because as you become more aware of it and you start looking for it, you really do start to spot just how underrepresented certain groups really are. And, and a lot of people would really... Um, uh, kind of perhaps dismiss the importance of this, but then those people would probably be predominantly white men. White men. But um, the, the interesting thing is I think that the opportunity, I think, for me is to see the viewpoints of so many other people. And for me, it's yeah. a much more interesting, it's much more diverse spectrum of, um, of voices and opinions and viewpoints. And I think that that's actually not only a great thing for us culturally, but also up, opens up all sorts of opportunities in terms of entertainment because... I mean, as we as we saw probably about two or three years ago, we say Crazy Rich Asians. I mean, he was a movie that Roadshow, uh, the the local distributor, 
assumed was probably going to be somewhere in the seven to ten million dollar range, but it really broke out and wound up doing about twenty million dollars nationally. And and I think that that made yeah. a lot of people kind of say, well, hold on, you don't really need to just make movies for very very specific, uh, right down the middle of the road audiences. There are a lot, there's a lot of interest amongst Australian moviegoers, particularly to go and engage with stories that perhaps are a little bit outside of what people assume uh, those audiences are actually interested in. Yep, yep, that's a, that's a really great point. Um, the third thing for me last year was, um, you know, 2019, there was uh, kind of almost a generational change. We had um, the final Avengers film and I'm certainly no expert <laughs> in that universe. Um, Game of Thrones um, and one movie highlight, um, yeah, but there's so many, but um, for me was um, Toy Story 4. Mm. You know, I, I took my, my husband and my kids and we we're in a pretty much a full cinema and I looked around and there was every demographic. There's, pe there's people that had grown up with it. They were millennials. Um, there was myself that, you know, I'd, I'd taken my kids when they were very young to Toy Story 3 and now we were seeing Toy Story 4. The film played on so many different levels and there was that joy of, of being in a full cinema and experiencing this kind of, you know, another great kind of movie moment. And, look, not all films have to be like that with, where you anticipate the event and you're part of that journey but um for me it really resonated a lot of, several things the importance of the community of cinema and, and seeing a, a film with an audience um you know guiding that next generation through and, and experiencing what cinema is and you know really good clever storytelling which is is um you know, is what disney kind of get right you know they, <laughs> they get their stories right yeah yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, for, for many years, I kind of, um, uh, I would go into a, a Pixar film kind of doubting what I was about to see. Is this going to be any good? And uh, I can't remember whether it was wall -E or Up, but one of the two came along and, uh, and it just threw me for such a loop that after that point, I just sort of thought, okay, moving forward, you really do need to go into every Pixar picture with an expectation that it's going to be really something special. Um, and be surprised when yep. it's not because they're just, they've just become such reliable filmmakers. I mean, there's been a few missteps, obviously, with, um, I think, Good Dinosaur yeah, and uh, the Cars movies uh, are visually spectacular but kind of, for me, don't really resonate in the way that perhaps um, uh, some of those other movies might. But, uh, but, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, 25 years, it's been 25 years since the last, or sorry, the first Toy, Toy Story film hit screens and to think that you'd get a fourth instance of installation 25 years later with most of the original um, people still on board. It's interesting because it kind of dovetails nicely with what you were talking about with the, um, the conclusion of so many other kind of cinematic universes like Marvel, etc. cetera, that, uh, and also um, even Star Wars, which was at the end of last year, which obviously had been mm. um, decades and decades since that all started. So, yeah, last year really was kind of a high point in terms of um, certain things uh, coming to an end, and it'll be very interesting to sort of see... Mm irrespective of what impact um, the, the coronavirus has on movie going, it'll be really interesting to kind of see yeah. uh, whether or not Hollywood can repeat that where you have so many major pictures all coming to some sort of conclusion point uh, all in the one year because uh, last year was extraordinary. Yeah. We throw in there things like um, the Aladdin remake and, say, um, uh, the Frozen sequel. I mean, it, it, was, it was an extraordinary slate of pictures and even though I think we all... Um, even though I think we all uh, uh, really, really enjoyed that, I think that uh, hopefully people also start looking for, for new stories and, and seeing what else is out there. So, I mean, thinking, yeah, yeah. thinking about what you've, uh, thinking about this, uh, this peculiar situation we all find ourselves in, I mean, is there anything that you've been kind of revisiting or, uh, or perhaps watching for the first time and what's really stood out for you and what has something, what, is there anything that you've kind of said that was awful and nobody should see that? Um, well, there was one that was a bit borderline because I, um, and we, we only watched it the other night and I'm a bit of a Mark Wahlberg fan because I think he's, he's been able to navigate a career from pop idol to, you know, you know, kind of serious actor. Yeah, movie um, Yeah, Departed and, and Fighter being um, two that come to mind pretty quickly. Mm. Um, on Netflix, there's Spencer Confidential. 
oh, and um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> the plot is pretty much there for you to work out from the get-go. There's actually a plot. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's yeah, I think it, it pulls, um, yeah, it pulls bits and pieces from pretty much any cop drama set in Boston. Um, and they, you know, they tried to elevate it at certain points, but yeah, it's just um, look if you if you want to switch your brain off um, and enjoy Mark Wahlberg, um, that you know that's your choice. Um, no uh, choice. <laughs> one, <th> <laughs> no um, uh, In our house, we uh, obviously love film, but uh, we also love sport and a, and a myriad of sport from kind of tennis. To, to cycling and um, my husband uh, dearly loves Formula One so this year isn't going to be a great year for him but there is a great Netflix series called Drive to Survive and I was pretty dubious about his um, accolades about this series but it is gripping viewing if you if you want to dive into kind of a behind the scenes of you know what makes teams run and leadership successful um, this this series is, is one to kind of binge watch because um, there's certainly the characters that you see constructed for, um, for for the races that we see, but the behind the scenes footage that Netflix have um, been able to acquire by following the teams for 2018 and 2019, obviously 2020, um, I'm not sure what will happen there, but it's, um, it's pretty compelling viewing. And um, for anyone that's looking at, at kind of what yeah? You know, what makes a great team and also leaders and um, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd highly recommend it. Um, Drive to uh, okay. I, It's funny it hasn't shown up on my algorithm at all. I mustn't be watching enough yeah. one racing movies. <laughs> you haven't been watching enough sport for it too. <laughs> if, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, so it's dry, Yeah, Drive to Survive. It's um, production values are phenomenal. Obviously, they've got lots of um, cash to throw at that. Um, <laughs> And look, I've, I've also been re-watching some of the films I just loved of the last six months. Um, Knives Out was a, a, in my top ten. Mm. We watched that again the other night. Um, Jojo Rabbit is just dear to my heart as, as a film that, that kind of stood out from uh, the Boxing Day Corridor. Um, mm. and, and The Joker, which, which I, I didn't mention in the kind of films and events in the previous question, but it was such an amazing film that um, didn't, you know, did not telegraph where that story was going to go and the standout performance by Joaquin um, just elevated that film to a classic and I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll look back in, in years to come and, and say that, you know, you know, that film's up there with the, the likes of obviously uh, taxi drivers and obvious um, parallels yeah. yeah it's interesting isn't it because i mean thinking about it i mean th there was a lot of kind of consternation about what the dc films were going to be like and they were sort of diminishing returns in uh, the justice leagues and the batman versus supermans etc and uh and this movie really came along and took a lot of people people by surprise i mean as an industry i think we all kind of weren't quite sure what to think about it was this going to be something that had the potential to break out or was it something that was going to cause some sort of act of, of human madness that would inevitably hurt the, mm. the box office appeal. But, you know, the latter never came to light, which was a, a wonderful relief, but I don't think anybody in the industry expected it was going to be the, the $40 million hit that it did become. Um, and it's, it's sort of interesting because I suppose uh, I agree with you that it's certainly going to be something that's going to stand out as, as, uh, as perhaps a podium of, of quality superhero drama. But because it is such a hard-hitting film and a movie that's not an easy watch, it's not as easily consumable as perhaps some of the Marvel pictures are in the way that you can just sort of sit down and throw on a Marvel yeah. movie and go, oh, I'm just going to spend two hours watching this. I've already seen it. I know all the beats, but it's going to entertain me. And, you know, at the end of it, I'll be, I'll be, I'll feel good. Whereas the feel bad approach to, um, to storytelling that, that Joker bought, uh, it will probably make it something that you revere, but perhaps maybe a little bit from a distance. Yep. Yeah. 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 So thinking ahead, I mean, obviously this is, uh, we, we, none of us know quite where this is all going to go and how long this is going to take, et cetera. Um, uh, and I was, in fact, I was just watching this, looking this morning and saw um, that uh, the Disney Plus um, 
uh, subscriptions have now hit 50 million worldwide, which a uh, brief calculation, a quick calculation worked out to be about a, a $6 billion a year um, income for, for Disney. So obviously people are at home, they're streaming. What does this mean for our industry and, and the, the larger industry in terms of uh, the studios and how they're going to behave in the, uh, in the, in the immediate future? Look, you know, I guess we all wish we had a crystal ball to know, to know what um, what the world on the other side of this is is going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, it, it will certainly be different. It, there's just no doubt about it. Um, I read a really interesting article. I've been reading a lot of articles, as, as I'm sure everyone in the industry has been. Um, a really interesting article yesterday from um, uh, the BBC, which uh, charted... Um, all the threats to cinema basically since day dot and, and how cinema has innovated, um, you know, whether it was the 1918 Spanish flu where, where cinemas were closed but for a very short amount of time and not globally or whether it was the advent of, you know, video. Um, and cinema's always been able to, I guess, you know, rise to the challenge of whatever that challenge is and reinvent itself. Um, what we have at the moment is this, this perfect kind of storm of, of streaming that's allowing customers to watch movies in the comfort of their own home, plus, you know, cinemas that are, that are shut. Um, so I would genuinely hope that there's, you know, honest conversations now about, um, you know, what can and can't be, can't, can't be done, um, you know, whether that, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I can't even answer that question for myself. Whether what is that? Um, I, I just, uh, I think culturally and and socially, cinema is is really important for you know talking back to those couple of points I mentioned earlier about you know that community feel, seeing a story on the big screen. Um, yeah, it, it's certainly it will be a different world, and and just what that that looks like is, is anyone's guess. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful from, from reading several articles that, that you know, we are able to rise to the challenge as, as cinema has done before and, and um, entice customers back with, with great stories and that cinema experience. Mm, yeah. Look, I think there's, there's two things to, to consider and uh, one of them you kind of touched upon earlier when you mentioned Spencer Confidential on Netflix and that is that you know, I think that considerably the exposure to so much streaming might might, might elevate the um, the value of cinema in the minds of a lot of people because you just don't get the same experience at home. Mm. Um, and uh, also, I think you know that that uh, that you're right. I think maybe there is an opportunity for all parties and uh, participants in this industry to kind of like perhaps take stock of of the way that we do operate and think about how it is that we move forward under this situation. Because I suppose the the consideration here is that the whole world's been caught short. Uh, with the arrival of the coronavirus, and um, and whilst uh, this obviously the the the, uh, the fact that we've seen a century between the Spanish flu and and now indicates that it's a once in a lifetime type thing. I mean, I suppose what's also been exposed by this mm. is the open borders across the world really do make something so easily transferable that maybe we actually need to have some sort of other thoughts in place in order to try and address these faster than um, than they may have been addressed and and having uh, trying to avoid this sort of uncertainty that we're all now staring down the barrel at. Um, but you know, I mean, I think the thing is, uh, I would like to think that um, that we'll all we'll all be desperate to uh, to go to the movies when we come out of this. Uh, just the other day, when I was um, when I was at work, I, I we were running the projectors because the uh, the projectors need to be run regularly in order to make sure that they don't sort of seize up and, and start having various little. Uh, software failures, and uh, and I happened to wander by a theatre where we were we were test we're not testing, but just running Parasite on the big screen, and uh, it was obviously that was a big, major picture for me last year with uh, with it becoming our biggest film of all time at yeah. Nova. But it was it was actually just this very brief reminder about just the the scale and the and the power of it, just like the dark room, the big picture, uh, um, and just this this kind of immersion that you just don't get in the living room uh, when you've got your phone and you've got your pets and you've got your family members all kind of vying for your attention. It's just not the same thing. So hopefully people will be, um, will be open to uh, that re-engagement once they, they get out the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and look, you're mentioning Parasite was an, another highlight for me. 
I saw it um, once it was once it had well and truly hit cinemas, mm. um, and that for me always a slight issue because uh, I've read I've read about it, I've read the reviews. You know, I mean, my expectations are well and truly up here, but it, it, it's such an amazing film on so many different levels. Um, and, you know, for me, it's the top film of 2019. It's just exquisite. Yeah. And um, I think we were all applauding when it won um, Best Picture um, and deservedly so. Yeah, absolutely. It just feels like a lifetime ago now, that's all. <laughs> it does. I do. Can we go back and repeat last year? <laughs> yeah, that, would, that would be delightful. I think that's a very good plan and we should all try and achieve that. Well, look, thanks for yeah. everyone for joining yeah. us on the Commission interview, Sasha. Uh, wishing you all the best. Uh, Pleasure. For, Thank for you. Your family and um, we'll, uh, we'll see you on yeah. the other side. Yeah. Best wishes to you too and thank you very much. <laughs>